I just want to start off a little story. In 1989, just as Tim Berners-Lee is sort of launching the foundation of what will become the World Wide Web, um, Kevin Kelly is invited by ABC to consult about where to go with this internet thing. You know, this internet is starting to get traction and ABC wanted to know what to do about it. And Kevin Kelly gave him his best pitch he could but ABC wasn't buying into it. In fact, later, Stephen Weisswasser suggested that you are not going to turn passive consumers into active trollers on the, on the internet. So we can kind of look at the scorecard today if we check where we stand right now. In 1948, ABC started broadcasting and they became the third network to do so. So they were like the third major network. And if you think of this, uh, this is 60 years ago. So it's 2008 minus 1948, 60 years. Those three networks, if they had been broadcasting every day for every hour of the day for those 60 years, it would be over 1.5 million hours of programming, which is a lot, but YouTube produced more in the last six months. And they did it without producers. They did it with just like people like you and me, anybody who's ever uploaded anything to YouTube. And so on YouTube today, there's over 9,000 hours that are uploaded every day. It's the equivalent of almost 400 always on TV channels, but it's not really 400 always on TV channels because it's actually 200,000 three minute videos. And trust me, I've watched about 8,000 videos in the last three weeks, and this is not mass media. <laughs> a, like a large percentage of this is actually met for less than 100 viewers, so it's really an interesting phenomenon. And 88% of the content that's coming through the front doors is new and original, which is actually better than the networks do. So, so, but that's the story of the numbers, and this is really a story about new forms of expression and new forms of community and new forms of identity emerging. And so instead, I want to start with another little story. And this one instead, we're gonna start with a Moldovan pop song from 2003. Everybody's like groaning, okay. <laughs> okay, so this is launched in 2003. It becomes a big hit in Italy in 2004. It spreads throughout Europe later that year. Um, then travels over to Japan where it mixes with the culture of animation where people start making videos of this. This, one of these videos travels all the way to the suburbs of New Jersey. And there, Gary Brolsma looks into his webcam and says, hello. <laughs> and this is like this great moment. I'll just let you hear the music for a second. Can you hear it? <laughs> okay. And uh, there's this great moment. That, uh, Gary Wolk has written about this. He says, Brolsma's video single-handedly justifies the existence of webcams. And he goes on to say, um, because he, he, here he is sitting in this dismal looking suburban bedroom, but he's really going for it, flirting with the camera, utterly given over to the mu music. It's a movie of someone who's having the time of his life, wants to share his joy with everyone, and doesn't care what anyone else thinks. <laughs> so this video uh, obviously becomes like a huge phenomenon. Um, some people have suggested it's been viewed 600 million times. I'm not sure what the, the proper statistic would be, um, but here you see some of the from New Jersey is finding itself into email boxes everywhere and folks this one is the real deal so he's on the Today Show he's on uh, VH1's best week ever he's like the new cyber star compared to the uh, the Star Wars kid now meanwhile this is February 2005 and meanwhile YouTube is just then being created so Chad Steve and Jawed are just registering it on April 23rd 2005 they launched YouTube they have the first videos posted on that day. And this is really interesting because it actually creates a new type of platform. It, up to this time, it was actually really difficult to upload video to the web. And now suddenly, everybody can join in this Numa Numa craze, and they did. As you can see, over 58,000 uh, videos have now been uploaded. And you'll see just people all over the world joining in this dance. And this, this then becomes sort of something really important that's going on. And again, Gary Wolk has this great line when he's talking about this. He, start, he says, they start to look less like an infectious joke than a new cultural order. These kids aren't mocking the Numa Numa guy, they're venerating him. And they're beautiful to see because they're replicating and spreading his happiness. They're following a ritual that's meaningful if not yet venerable, learning the dance, lip singing the song, documenting their performance just so, making it available for the world to see. So I kind of like to think of Gary as the first guy on the dance floor of this global mixer. And, and, <laughs> and there's a lot more going on than just dancing. And you know, you think about the joy that people are expressing and the fun that they're having uh, as they do this dance. And I like to think of it as more than just a dance, it's a celebration. It's a celebration of new forms of empowerment. New, you know, anybody with a webcam now has a stronger voice and presence. Uh, it's a celebration of new forms of community uh, and types of community that we've never really seen before, global connections, transcending space and time. 
It's a celebration of new and unimaginable possibility. And so, you know, you can say that this is all hype, like these are just people dancing and having fun, but think about what they're dancing in front of. They're dancing in front of about a billion boxes in places all over the world that are networked together and allowing us to connect in ways we've never connected before. And in fact, they can actually invent new ways to connect with each other, and it's getting easier and easier to do so. And so some, that's why I like to think that this is really just a very important moment. So I tried to capture some of the changes that are going on on the web with this video last year that about half of you have seen. This is the machine is using us. And I started with text and thinking about how it was different than a world based in text. Um, I could have started with TV. It might have been an interesting video as well. Um, but I started with, with uh, text on paper and thinking about what it meant to move to digital text and what that move really means. I'm just going to speed this up so you don't have to watch the whole thing. Um, but in general, what I was trying to get at was that when you unpack the impacts of the of digital text and you think about the separation of form and content blogs wikis tagging all of these things it leads to a necessity to really think what the web is all about that it's not just about information that it's actually about linking people and it's about linking people in ways that we've never been linked before and in ways we can't even predict because it's changing almost every six months now there's a new tool out there that connects us in some new way so I suggested at the end of that we were going to need to rethink a few things. And as an anthropologist, I sort of see everything as connected. So like, I really have the sense that we're going to have to rethink all of these things. I actually have a theory about each one of these, if you want to pin me down in questions, I, even about love. <laughs> so um, what really surprised me after the video was, and I think what really drives home the point, is not the video itself, but what happened afterwards. So I uploaded this on a Wednesday, and it was Wednesday before Super Bowl Sunday, and that becomes important, and I'll tell you why in a second. So I actually uh, made it by myself on this kind of, frankly, it's not a very nice computer, um, in the basement of my house here in, in Kansas. And I was working alone, except for I was, I was actually sort of collaborating with a guy in the Ivory Coast of Africa, because he had uploaded some of his music. I'm a horrible musician, but he had some great music. He uploaded it, and he put a Creative Commons license on it which meant that I could use it for my video. So we were able to collaborate across time and space, essentially. Now, this is then on Friday. So two days after I uploaded it, you can see it had 253 views. And I had to take the screenshot, because as an anthropologist, if your work reaches more than like 200 people, this is a really big deal. So, <laughs> so, so I, I took the screenshot. And I actually sent it to my department head you know, to put it in the tenure file. And, uh, and then the, that was on uh, Friday. Um, Saturday, it had jumped to over 1,000. And I thought, oh, OK, something's going on here, because it was actually growing exponentially. And I could actually see the count speeding up. It was going faster and faster. And I thought, OK, what's going on? So I started looking around on the web, trying to figure out what was going on. And I found it at dig.com. So what dig.com is, dig is a place where um, it's basically like user-generated filtering. So what you just saw was the video was user-generated content. This is like user-generated filtering, where the users can get together and they can they can give it a thumbs up if they like it, they can dig it, or they, if they don't like it, they can bury it. And the stuff that gets dug up ends up on the front page. And here you can see it's actually coming out to the front page through this user-generated filtering process. And then uh, several thousand more people see it. Then the same thing is going over on Delicious, where a lot of people are tagging it. So if you guys don't know how tagging works, for example, if they're watching the video here, they can push a button, and then it tags it for them. It basically bookmarks it. But those bookmarks are shared with the world. And so when they tag it with a word like Web 2.0, it goes back to delicious on the Web 2.0 list. And there's a lot of people actually sort of watching this list who are interested in Web 2.0, or whatever it is you're interested in. And you watch that list, and you'll see these things appear. So this is user-generated organization. But because this stuff is actually being distributed out and coming right onto people's front page in many cases through RSS feeds and this type of thing, it's also user-generated distribution. So you think about this massive media machine that we've existed with for so long and the massive distribution system and organization system and all this, there's now a user-generated alternative to all this. And that's what really moved this video around the web. So there's also going throughout the blogosphere. And it's, this is user-generated commentary. Uh, but the cool thing about that is that each time somebody blogs it, it actually kind of scores a point, you might say, on Technorati. 
And so Technorati is actually counting the number of times people are blogging these things and keeping track of these. So there's a ranking system. So this is now Super Bowl Sunday morning. And it's, it was actually appeared in the top five. And I was just totally blown away by this. But we knew uh, it was Super Bowl Sunday. So we're thinking, oh, gosh, by you know, 7 o'clock tonight, all the viral videos from the Super Bowl or all the commercials are just going to bombard the web. And we're going to be blasted out of the top 20. So we're just like hitting refresh, refresh, refresh. My, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> my wife and I are just sitting there, refresh, refresh. And we're hoping it'll get to number one. And it actually did. So by noon that day, it was, it was the number one video in the blogosphere. Um, and then actually the next day, uh, most of the videos were from the Super Bowl, but standing on top of that uh, was my video. So here we had these commercials, which on average cost $3.6 million to produce and get out on the web. And my little video, which cost nothing to produce, was sitting on top. So there's really something interesting going on here. This has taken some time ago. You can see it had almost 5 million views at that time. Uh, over 13,000 people were writing about it. Uh, it went on to well, local news, at which point she noted, who knew so anthropology exciting. could be so much fun? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there, you, see, and you saw the introduction earlier, it went to Wired, um, it was translated into 12 different languages within a matter of months, uh, went all over the world from there. So we're really living in a different kind of mediascape here. YouTube is a part of it, but it's actually, you got to think about the whole mediascape. You can't just think about YouTube if you're thinking about the anthropology of YouTube. And so my video is an example where posted on YouTube, I send it out on email, it travels in through the blogosphere, it goes through Facebook and MySpace and Dig and so on. And this is showing that there's this really in interesting integrated mediascape that we now live in. And at the center of this mediascape is us. And that makes things especially interesting. And as an anthropologist, I, I think of media maybe slightly differently than most people. I don't think of it as, as content. I think of, and I don't even think of it as tools of communication. I think of media as mediating human relationships. And that's important because when media change, then human relationships change. And that's where the anthropology of this comes in. And that's why I wanted to suggest that we're going to have to rethink all of these things, including ourselves. So as uh, what we've been doing in the last two years now with my students, I have about 10, graduates, or 10 undergraduate students uh, every spring. And we just launch into a study of YouTube each spring. And I'll show you kind of what we do. Um, this is just some of the quantitative work we do, for example. It's like we'll watch a YouTube video in this uh, part of the screen here. And we'll have a data uploading thing over here. And, and the students can upload at any time. Anytime they're watching YouTube videos, they can be taking notes on the videos. And all that goes to a database that we can then analyze. And uh, just to give you a sense of who is on YouTube, it's kind of interesting because this is about digital natives, but it's very interesting to look at the, the uh, age ranges here. If you look at 35 and over, about 25% of YouTube videos feature somebody 35 and over, which is actually the same as the number of teens, 12 to 17. The really strong group presence on YouTube happens to be in the 18 to 24 age group, and also the young adult, so kind of uh, 25 to 34. Those are the, most, the strongest age groups. Over 50% of videos have an 18 to 24-year-old in them. Now, what's on YouTube? This is where things get kind of interesting. So I'm just going to give you a quick little tour of what's out there. So here's a 92-year-old Irving Fields singing about YouTube. And there's a lot of songs about YouTube on YouTube, if you're interested in those. But the most commonly uploaded videos on YouTube are actually home videos. And this is a famous example that many of you may have seen. Most of, the, most of the uploads on video are actually meant for less than 100 viewers. Ah. Ooh. Ouch. Ouch. Ouch, Ouch. Charlie. Ouch. Ouch. Charlie. Ouch. Ouch. Now, what's really interesting about this is the sort of participatory nature of YouTube. This has been redone or remixed about uh, over 2,000 times. Some of these remixes actually get really sophisticated. So here somebody's actually remixed it using Fruity Loops, if you know what that is. I'll show you what it is in a second. But there's actually like the simple, the simplicity of drag and drop editing, sort of almost like cut and paste work with video and audio 
can lead to all sorts of things. So for example, this, this is 16-year-old DeAndre Cortez Way, who uh, created this song um, in the beginning of 2007 using this program here. And then he uploaded this little video to YouTube and MySpace. And some of you know the song. Um, but, so he uploads this little video and it starts to spread. And it just goes and goes and goes. And pretty soon, like, it seems like everybody in the world is doing this dance. Including prisoners in the Philippines. That's a real video. These are MIT professors and graduate students studying participatory culture. <laughs> and here's some high school teachers getting in on the act. This just goes and goes and goes. It's just a complete phenomenon. This is the Harry Potter version. <laughs> and the Lion King version. And so th these are all just massively, massive generation of remixes about this. The SpongeBob version just goes on and on. Okay, so that's April 2007. August 2007. By August 2007, he's signed by a major label because he's a total phenomenon by this time. And, and when they made the official video through the record label, they sort of made fun of themselves. The record label kind of made fun of themselves because they had been blindsided by this user-generated content becoming bigger than anything they had produced. So they produced this video, and actually you can see it's a total commentary on how it actually emerged through the web and them finally sort of catching up. Just a few more notes about this. Um, you can see it's all about new media. Uh, but this ended up uh, seven weeks at the top of the Billboard Hot 100. Um, not bad for something that started off as user-generated content. It also was a, nominated for a Grammy Award. Um, <laughs> so here's what's really interesting, is that almost 10,000 videos on YouTube out of the 200,000 are addressed to the YouTube community every day. Their videos like this. Hi, everybody. Yo, Swift Cry Chop, Monkey Dude 1212 here. Hi, YouTube. This is Powers. So, just thinking about why, you know, we can start with, with some studies of uh, the lack, the loss of community over time. So, Robert Putnam is famous for this, but a lot of other people have been looking at this as well. Um, and, you know, some of the explanations that are around for this general sense of a loss of community are things like when women join the workforce, there's, a, there's suddenly less free time. Um, moving from the corner grocery store to these large supermarkets and ultimately these huge big box stores. Uh, there's a number of things that are contributing to this. And so suddenly we're in these, these massive communities of suburbia where we're disconnected and connected only by by roadways and TVs, and the TVs themselves are isolating. So there's many different analyses of why culture or why community has been in decline. Um, and meanwhile, new forms of networks and communities are emerging. So for example, we now have all these cell phones around, and Barry Wellman has this great uh, comment where he talks about moving from place to place to person to person connectivity. Uh, phenomenon he calls networked individualism. So you think about this state that we're in now where we're increasingly networked but also individualized. Uh, we, there's this cultural inversion going on where we're becoming increasingly individual but many of us still have this really strong value and, and desire for community. So the more individual we become, the more we long for this community. Uh, we become increasingly independent while longing for stronger relationships. And we see increasing commercialization all around us, and we long for authenticity. And YouTube comes into the midst of all this. And, and I think the, what we see in YouTube actually is shaped by this. This is Robert Putnam's comment from 1995. He says, my hunch is that meeting in an electronic forum is not the equivalent of meeting in a bowling alley. And we agree with him. And that's why we had to actually sort of get involved. And this is one of my students. Um, this is me. We actually just started getting on YouTube and participating in this community. And this is, in anthropology, we call this participant observation. It's like, it's the core of our methodology. They actually have to experience the phenomenon to understand it. This is me doing participant observation in New Guinea. And <laughs> here we are back in, uh, in YouTube. So we went ahead and introduced ourselves to the YouTube community in the spring of 2007 with this video. Hey, 
Flesh. I'm a professor at Kansas State University and I'm teaching a class called Digital Ethnography. And ethnography is the study of a culture and we are studying the culture of YouTube. So I have a whole team of students here and I'm going to take you down the hall over here and you're actually going to meet the students. And this is kind of important because one of the things we do in anthropology is uh, what we call participant observation. It means that we don't just observe the things that we're studying, we actually participate in the things that we're studying. So the people you're going to meet today in class are people you're going to see inside YouTube and they're going to be you know, responding to your videos, they're going to be posting questions themselves, they're going to be vlogging, they're going to be there in the community right there with you. All right, um, hope you can join us online. We'd like to see you around. Uh, what else do you want to call? We really need your help. Yeah, yeah we need your help. Just uh, come visit us online, come talk to us, and it'll be a good time. And be our friend. <laughs> All right, cool. We'll see you, see you on YouTube. All right, so then we, we uh, were thinking about, back to that idea that when media change, human relations change, we wanted to look at the actual medium of community for YouTube, which is primarily the platform itself, but also webcams and screens. We wondered, what is it like to build a community through webcams and screens? And that meant actually participating, and we got this uh, great insight early on, as you'll see from this student here. Um, you know. I'm you know, looking at a camera, and I uh, had a mirror around here to shift show you guys but oh here it is this is what I'm talking to not you this well you but this I'm talking to you but for the time being I don't know who you are and so if you meditate on this just for a second and to think about what this means um, first off you're every time you talk on a webcam you're talking to some some place that's unknown you actually don't know who's going to be talking back to you um, the, so you have sort of an invisible audience phenomenon it's asynchronous so you never know when they're going to watch you and you think about when you talk every time you talk you're you're sort of sizing up the context and in this case you actually don't know what the context is you can be launched into many many different contexts including your video can be remixed by somebody so you don't actually know what's going on. And this is what we came to call context collapse. And when we started watching first vlogs and did first vlogs ourselves, we, it's like this deep experience of context collapse. The moment you look into a webcam for the first time and you try to start talking, you have this sense like you just don't know who you're talking to and therefore you just come out sounding all awkward. We do, do a search for first vlogs on YouTube and you'll see what I'm talking about. But here's a, an example from our first vlogs. Start with mine, but... <laughs> Hey. <laughs> hey, I'm Mike Wesch. I'm a professor at Kansas State University. I actually wore that fake smile through the whole thing. I just didn't know what to do, you know? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, my name's Jesse. And I feel like I should put a picture of a person right here. You know, maybe an eye. It would be so much better if this thing blinked and smiled and responded to what I said. Uh, this is like the seventh time I've tried to take this. Okay, so I thought I'd do this before my roommate gets back and finds me talking myself. So I am in my closet. Um, I feel a little strange out in the family room just talking to what seems like myself. So, I don't really know what to talk about. What do people talk about the first vlogs? I mean, what do people talk about anyway? Uh, <laughs> Beautiful. Man, I totally blazed past actually introducing myself. Um, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, my name's, oh yeah, my name is Melissa by the way, um, and I'm a college student, college student, enunciate, um, uh, so we're just gonna talk, okay? <laughs> and to tell you the truth, I actually spent about five minutes deciding how I was gonna work my hair back or up, all forming this identity in this new mask to my new community. And this is actually really deep, right, because you have this situation where you're trying to form this new mask, your new identity, in a space where it seems like everybody is watching and yet nobody's there. And so it's like, it feels like 
at once the most private space because it's your own bedroom or wherever it might be, but it's also quite possibly the most public space on the planet. You know, when you think about the number of people that might actually see this. And so there begins to be a lot of reflection about self on YouTube, and you can just, it's, it's a great place to study self and identity if you're into that. Um, but I'll give you just a little bit of background on this. If you think of like Charles Cooley's idea of the looking glass self, it's this idea that we actually know ourselves through, the, through our understanding of how others understand us. And this is, uh, becomes really complicated and uh, on when you're looking through a webcam and mediating your life through this webcam. I'll show you just one example and then I'll add on to that. And you know, you know other people are going to be observing you, but they're not right at the second that you're making your video. So you're more yourself. So this, this self-reflection happens on while, while they're looking through these webcams, but adding to it not, isn't just the fact that anybody and everybody might be looking at you through that webcam. It's also the fact that you yourself might look through that, that and see that video again someday. So there's really this hyper self-awareness that's developing as people are doing this. We live in the world of the instant replay. Around the planet, all the events are not only being recorded, but replayed. And the amazing thing about the replay is that it offers the means of recog, recognition. The first time is cognition, the second time is recognition. And the recognition is even deeper. I decided to make a blog, not only for myself, but for anyone who cares to watch, to document my transition. And um, I'll be able to look back, and I suppose you will too, to see you know, how far, if at all, I've come. So replay offers a deeper level of awareness than the, the first play. We had, to, you know, been getting into some very large matters about the effects of this new environment, this new electric environment on man and his awareness of himself. I guess that's what makes me so uncomfortable talking on camera. It's just like, right now I'm looking at my face and like, good God. Because <sighs> when I think of myself, I guess I don't really think of myself the way I appear to other people. Which is, yeah, young, naive. Oh, she's so cute. The cute little girl. Not cute. <laughs> So generally people on YouTube when they're in front of their uh, cameras are in a very self-reflexive kind of mood and you'll actually see that in a lot of the videos. But there's also this other side which is that when we watch YouTube we're, at, we're generally anonymous. People can't see us watching it and this has its own impacts as well. Most famously is probably Lev Grossman's op observation in time yeah. where he says some of the comments on YouTube make you weep for the future of humanity just for the spelling alone, never mind the obscenity <laughs> and the naked hatred. So I, uh, this, was, this was the actual page I was on when I decided to make this clip. And I'll just take you through what was said here. Um, it's really interesting dialogue. Uh, this is responded by Wingman8788. You guys are so gay, it sucks. QWERTY U121, what the fuck are you talking about? Freckly Girl 14 says, YouTube comments make me angry, grr. And QWERTY U responds by saying, then don't comment on YouTube, you shit stain. <laughs> so. There is this uh, anonymity plus this physical distance plus a rare and ephemeral dialogue create, enable the possibility for this type of hatred, but there's something else. That same anonymity, physical distance, and rare and ephemeral dialogue allow people to feel sort of really relaxed and have this freedom to experience humanity without fear of or say, social anxiety. You can actually sort of stare at people and sort of see them for who they are. It's slightly voyeuristic, you know? And, um, it allows you to watch other people without staring at them or making them uncomfortable because they don't see you watching them. You can just watch their videos. And it's really interesting. It's like this sociological experiment where you can just like see their being. You can see their person. You almost get the sense, if you think of James Joyce's terms aesthetic, of aesthetic arrest, and it, they, you get the sense that people are actually experiencing the sense of being just totally overwhelmed by the beauty of the human in front of them. Like people have this really profound, deep connection with other humans through YouTube. 
that maybe they couldn't experience in everyday life because they're not allowed to stare, because they're not allowed to just experience this person as a human being. And so we started looking at why this might be, and we're looking at this cultural inversion I mentioned earlier, where we tend to express individualism, independence, and commercialization while desiring community, relationships, and authenticity. And this is really a tension that, and, and as these sort of lonely individuals, we, cr we crave this connection, but at the same time, as individuals, we see that connection as constraint. And what, what we're seeking then through technologies often is a, a form of connection without constraint, some way of connecting very deeply uh, without feeling the, res the deep responsibilities of that deep connection. So YouTube offers this possibility, and what we see on YouTube is people connecting very, it's very amazing. deeply. It's just amazing to me how powerful this, this medium is. I mean, I'm just I'm sitting, I'm sitting in my living room, you know, talking to a camera. My God, the interaction, it, it's unbelievable. This will get you in the mood so that you're like, oh, this is how it's done. It's casual. We just talk to the camera here. Put that there, see if that helps. I gotta figure this thing out eventually. Just uh, came by to say, uh, came by, what do you mean came by? I didn't come by, I'm sitting right here. January is a hard month for me. Right now, I should be preparing for my, the birth of my son, Zachary. But I'm not, as you guys already know. Hi, Mel. I watched your video and uh, sorry I'm running behind on my schedule here. I was listening to it and I felt my tears coming. This is a big fucking experiment in putting myself out. We're all learning from each other and about ourselves. And that's what I think fucking YouTube should be about. Thank you guys. A lot of people report having this really deep, profound experience on YouTube, which maybe surprises those of you who have only seen the skateboarding dog or, you know, the Star Wars kid or something like that. Um, but if you ask the, these people in the YouTube community, you know, there's this, uh, there was a little thread that went through recently, like, what does YouTube mean to you? And a lot of people said free hugs. Well, what were they talking about? Well, there's actually a hero that sort of emerged in all this, and it's one man, J-U-A-N-M-A-N-N. -N. And this is a guy who came home to Sydney after uh, being in Britain for some time, and there was nobody there to greet him. He was one of these lonely individuals with no community. And he felt like he needed a hug, so he went, he started this campaign. He'd go down to the mall here and hold up this free hug sign. And after some time, eventually people started hugging him. And he started, it was this profound connection to anonymous people, yet coming together and, and sharing a hug. And pretty soon it starts to spread, other people start taking up the signs. You can see it, uh, they put it on YouTube, it has nearly 30 million views now. And then it goes worldwide, from YouTube it goes global. So people all over the world start doing this. And the fact that this becomes like an icon on YouTube is, is important in, in thinking about, you know, what this means for people who are trying to connect and trying to build these strong connections, trying to reconnect with humanity in some profound way. This YouTube community is not without drama though. And so here we get into the drama stuff. <laughs> is anybody involved in YouTube that is part of this drama and stuff? <laughs> okay, so this will be fun. Um, so in general, like there is, YouTube is a platform and, and in order to be seen on YouTube, even to be seen, I mean, think about 200,000 videos being uploaded every day. And the only way to get to the front page is through the editors of YouTube. And the only other way to really be prominent on YouTube is to be one of the most popular, the most discussed, the most recent, the most responded, the most viewed, one of the top favorites or the top rated. And that's really challenging to do. And then there's also channels on YouTube here. And these channels are also ranked. And so if you want people to see your channel, again, you have to be one of these most subscribed. So there's all these people really competing to be one of these stars so that they can be seen. So I'll give you a, an idea of, of what these YouTube stars look like, because there really is like this whole burgeoning community of YouTube stars. Here's one, uh, one of the first hey, ones. Hey, my name is Matt. This is my first video blog. Um, I don't really know what to say, 
some note on video blog before, but you know, I'm just giving it a go, seeing if I like it or not. Okay, so this gets interesting. Six days um, later. So yeah, this home goes directly to Matt. Um, it's like 21 Ohio. And um, yeah, here's, here's the poem. I saw your videos and I thought you were hot. You seem really deep and I liked you a lot. But I'm kind of shy, so I did something dumb. I made fun of you and I thought it was fun. But this is the real me and I like you. And I really hope that you like me too. This actually turns into a love story. So over the next month, like through YouTube, you have these two talking back and forth and creating a love story. And thousands of people are tuning in to watch this. And, and, they, and they become two of the first stars on YouTube, in early days of, of YouTube. And then April 26, 2006, this is the video that was posted. Good evening, you're watching BBC News. We've had reports that emo kid 21 Ohio was brutally murdered outside his internet home today. Police suspect that the killer used a source of truth to kill the internet sensation. Although the motives remain unclear, it is believed that emo kid, an Englishman from rugby, was killed for masquerading as a self-obsessed American teen. Just before his death, he released a statement. Hello, uh, it's me, Matt, again. As you can probably tell, um, I'm not an emo kid from Ohio. Um, I thought it would be amusing to masquerade as one. Um, but unfortunately, somebody yesterday or the day before, I can't remember which, um, found my real MySpace profile. So this is where things get interesting. There becomes an authenticity crisis on YouTube, which is still going and on one today. Day while I was through the most discussed list, I found Only Girl 15. It was about a 16-year-old girl who had strict parents and was locked up in a room a lot. And she had to find means to amuse herself. Hi guys, um, so this is my first video blog. Uh, I thought it was surprisingly, you know, kind of cute and funny and charming. And I'm such a big fan of Lonely Girl. Brie is awesome and her videos, each one of her videos are so interesting. And so I went to the LonelyGirl15.com fan site slash forum. When I started posting, there couldn't have been more than, I think there might have been 38 threads. And within a few days, it had exploded to 200 threads. Check this out. While I'm recording a video, are you fake or are you real? Earlier today, Brave Girl 5 posted a video called Lonely Girl 15 is out, not kidding y'all. Now, I don't know if this news is true. I don't know if this is real. I don't have any substantial major evidence except for what people have told me. But. Lonely Girl is fake. To some, Lonely Girl 15 was a kindred internet spirit, to others, an obvious teen soap opera. Many of them believe that she was a homeschooled American teenager, but she's been revealed as New Zealander Jessica Rose. The soap opera was the work of three wannabe scriptwriters. This project was done in a bedroom with a $130 webcam and two desk lamps. Our intent from the very beginning of this was to tell a very realistic fictional story. Everybody's just mad because they got duped, they got fooled. And people don't like being fooled. Do not like being deceived. YouTube is just not for fake stuff. It's for real stuff. It's starting to look like this whole thing could turn into a bit of a witch hunt. And people could start tra trying to track down all the people that are pretending to be, you know, people they aren't really. Is Renato for real? Uh, you know, is, is Geriatric 1927 for real? And is Ken RG for real? If it's not real, you should come on and tell everybody now. The creators released this statement saying, who is she? Lonely Girl 15 is a reflection of everyone. It's very poetic. <laughs> um, and they go on to say here, she is no more real or fictitious than the portions of our personalities that we choose to show or hide when we interact with the people around us. Very like sociological, anthropological. And it actually I sort of to... sparked a series of, of posts of people sort of reflecting on YouTube and whether or not YouTube could be truly authentic given the, the production capacities. Reveal that I...
I would like to reveal that I, too, am a fake. I mean, I don't really act like this moron-type character in real life. Why would I use so many hand gestures, and why would I be screaming at my, my, my camera? It doesn't make any sense, unless I'm acting, which I am. Everyone is an independent producer on YouTube. The first thing you probably notice is this big green screen in the back, and that's a collapsible green screen to allow me to set it up and have any kind of background that I want. I'm never going to get this right. Let's try it again. Whereas once I had 60 videos up on my profile, now I have 27. It's getting awfully easy to click remove video from this site. I'm actually an 18 year old girl from Connecticut. It's, it's a difference between having many faces, as you might describe it, to having one very diverse face. You know, I'm to the point where I don't know what, what, to, what to do anymore. I mean, would you all prefer if I just did videos like this all the time? Is this more your cup of tea? I mean, tell me. I don't know. <laughs> Or do you like it down and dirty with a loco mama? Pshht. So, you can see my dilemma. But you don't know what's real out here and what isn't real. You know, like, I was the person, me and Emo Girl, we made YouTube what it is today. We don't want any fakes here. We don't want any frauds here. We don't want any liars here. Get rid of all the fakes, get rid of all the liars. If you're going to play a role, if you're going to be an actor or an actress on YouTube, tell everyone that you're playing a role. So something else really interesting about this, and people start gaming the system to get more views. So, for example, if you don't know this, at the, be the, the thumbnail that's used on your video is the exact middle point of the video you upload. So people start like putting these little flash frames right in the middle. Um, and if you look today, uh, any day, any day, two or two or three of the top ten will be some sort of sexy thumbnail, and it works. So, for example, this one, which is uploaded with this thumbnail, gets over two million views. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in the in the sort of gaming the system, they're actually sort of exposing the system at the same time, which is sort of this playful nature of YouTube. So, for example, this one is actually legitimate medical knowledge about how to sleep better. This one is about uh, net neutrality. It's a very serious political statement. And this one, uh, this next one you'll see here, this is from Lisa Nova, who is actually directly attacking this particular phenomenon that people are putting these sexy thumbnails Are you thumbnails sick of all there. the sexy thumbnails and mainstream media videos that now dominate all of the lists on this website, keeping your videos from getting the exposure they deserve? Heck yeah, I'm sick of that crap. Me too! Those lists used to be filled with wonderful user-generated content like yours. So she offers these little clips that you can put in the middle of your video so you can have like a sexy woman with a machine gun. <laughs> See how it works? Just pick your very own Lisa Nova collab character, insert her into your video, and get the exposure you deserve. The possibilities are endless. It's time to give YouTube back to the user-generated members who built this site. <laughs> So this is actually an example of something much bigger, the seriously playful <laughs> participatory uh, culture, which is extending into the real world. It, it, it um, gets into politics as well. So you guys have probably seen this, April 19th, that old, 2007. That old John Beach Boy song, Bomberan. <laughs> <laughs> So this is uploaded to YouTube. It gets all over the place. Bum, Three days bum, later. Bum, 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 no apologies, though, for a musical parody that many around the world took as a true sign of his thinking. When veterans are together, they're veterans joke. And I was with veterans and we were joking. So this is sort of like the context collapse of everyday life that we all face now with, you know, you never know where a camera is going to be and where it's going to upload, be uploaded to YouTube. So we have this, uh, it's really profoundly affecting our lives. So now here we have marketers who are also trying to sort of get on board and get these, um, this participatory culture to work for them. So here Chevy actually allowed you to take clips of their new Tahoe, um, 
make your own commercial, add your own soundtrack, add your own uh, uh, phrases and so on, and this is the result. It's not exactly what they wanted. And this is something really uh, quite profound that's happening, where we can remix this culture that's being thrown at us. We can take it, reappropriate it, and throw it back. And this is one of the most poetic statements of this. This is by um, Blim Visible. And you hear the Regina Spector lyrics there, where she says, even though our parts are slightly used. And then goes on and says, these are all clips from, uh, from different films. And she's saying, we're living in a den of thieves, rummaging for answers in the pages. It's a really powerful poetic statement because most of what we do is actually illegal. Any remixing is basically illegal. And I can talk more about the, the parameters of that. We have fair use laws that should protect it, but the simple act of ripping a DVD is actually illegal, which makes virtually everything we do illegal. So here we are in this, this state. Here's Lawrence Lessig talking about this. We need to recognize you can't kill the instinct the technology produces, we can only criminalize it. We can't stop our kids from using it, we can only drive it underground. We can't make our kids passive again, we can only make them, quote, pirates. And is that good? We live in this weird time, this kind of age of prohibitions, where in many areas of our life, we live life constantly against the law. Ordinary people live life against the law, and that's what I, we are doing to our kids. They live life knowing they live it against the law. That realization is extraordinarily corrupt, extraordinarily corrupting. And in a democracy, we ought to be able to do better. The best part about this video here is by uh, by uh, Lim or Blim Visible. Um, somebody commented, "My God, are you doing that for a living? I never saw anything like this. You're an artist." She responds, "Nope, I'm a housewife." <laughs> and that's sort of the beauty of YouTube today. Now, there's something even more interesting. It's not just people working alone and producing things, but the fact that thousands of people all around the world can collaborate together. And Mad V is, has sort of become a platform for this. Um, you can see he he st remains anonymous, which actually allows him to be more of a platform. People sort of participate through him. And he makes these calls. For example, this one, he just says, make a simple statement on your hand and show it to the world. And so he demonstrates it here. This becomes the most responded to video in the history of YouTube. Um, thousands of responses, people writing on their hands a message, just a simple message. And so you think about this webcam and think about them sitting in their homes, wherever they might be, and what do you think they might reach out with to say? And the, the messages are really uh, quite revealing as well as powerful, I think. So here's uh, some of it here. You can see this the sense you are not alone or connected. This In this self-reflective place, people thinking about themselves, saying, love yourself, love you, love all the people. And also this connection here is key. We are all connected. And you know, when you see people expressing values like this, it's not necessarily, um, it's often because these things don't act, they feel like these are missing in their lives. So a value, a cultural value is often something that's not actually really as prevalent as they'd like it to see. That's why it has to be said. And you see at the end here, a lot of oneness and sort of breaking down of boundaries and so on. This is certainly not a completely amoral or immoral community by any means. They have very strong values that are emerging. So as I was looking at this, I was reminded of uh, some of the comments that have been made about the first Earth rise, when people first saw the Earth rise, that first picture. And Carl Sagan, of course, is probably most famous for this, for his um, poetry really about the pale blue dot from the Voyager picture of 1990 and he describes that pale blue dot this is a picture of earth here in a ray of sun and he says 
Um, he says, consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you have ever heard of, everyone who has lived out their lives, everybody. And he goes on. It's very poetic. He ends by saying, the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. And so I was sitting there working on this project and looking up at my webcam <laughs> and thinking about the little glass dot. And I just broke out in some poetry here, um, <laughs> which I hope you'll excuse. But um, it too may not seem of any particular interest, but consider again that dot. That's there. That's somewhere else. That's everybody. On the other side of that little glass dot is everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, everyone who's living out their lives that has access to the internet, billions of potential viewers, and your future self among them. Some have called this the, most, the biggest and the smallest stage, the most public space in the world from the privacy of our own homes. It has been used for many things, a political soapbox, a comedian stage, a religious pulpit, a teacher's podium, or just a way to reach out to a next door neighbor or across the world, to people we love, people we want to love, or people we don't even know, to share something deep or something trivial, something serious or something funny, to strive for fame or to simply connect. It can be many things, but it cannot be just one thing. And it cannot be only what you want it to be. It is not just what you make of it. It is what we make of it. It's a little glass dot in the eyes of the world. And just to close this out, I wanted to introduce you to sort of a hero of mine, B. Nessel, 1973. Um, some of you may have seen his work. Um, but he lost his son to SIDS uh, in early 2007. And I'll let him close it out with his words here. April 17th, 2007. Creating characters gave me an escape. It allowed me to be silly. It allowed me to act how I wanted to feel. It became a form of therapy, a, a coping mechanism. And after a while, it brought fun back to YouTube for me. You accepted my characters, even embraced them. And by doing so, you opened your arms to me. You allowed me to continue to have the escape I still need from the hard times while giving me the chance to talk about what I have gone through. And I am eternally grateful to you all. Some people have said that the videos we make on YouTube should be created in hopes to change the world. I've made mine to help me live in it. And whether I make a hundred more or a thousand more, I will know forever that this website, this community, help bring me life again. And there's something really special in that.
Vrei să pleci, dar nu mă nu mai e. My, my, my.